Who is going to carry out the transformations that would make permanent revolution a reality in countries like Egypt and Tunisia? like the Basque Country, or Catalonia, or, or Galicia, and we don't see the Spanish state as Spain as a nation, as a country, so we, that's why we speak about the Spanish state. Okay, I, I hope you understand. Well, um, to speak about the radical left in the Spanish state, um, sometimes it's quite depressing, since in the 80s, big revolutionary organizations collapsed, and the communists and the socialists or social democrat party betrayed their social basis and many people who were fighting for something more than the democracy democracy we have now um, were disappointed no? as many workers in for example in tunisia or, or egypt who are working for some, something more than the democracy we have now here no? in europe well um, but um, so we have a quite a small and divided radical left in the Spanish state. But to understand the, the, the parties of the radical left in the Spanish state, as Antonio Granchi, the Italian revolutionary, said, we have to analyze the sociopolitical situation. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, as you know, we have a social democrat government that with the president Zapatero that is acting as the Spanish state has been rescued as Greece or as Portugal or, or as Ireland and is mm, doing mm, very anti-social reforms and attacking the working class very very deep. He's cutting the, he has cut the, the public worker salaries, he's privatizing public companies, he's cutting public services as education or healthcare, is has made a new labor market reform, so now it's easier to fire and cheaper to fire a worker. It has changed the retirement age from 65 to 67, and all these measures are not helping to, to escape the crisis, but are deepening the crisis very much. The situation, the social situation right now in the Spanish state is quite depressing. We have a 20 21% of unemployment, more than 5 million people are unemployed. Many of them have gone, have to emigrate to other countries, for example, to London, looking for a job. We have 50% of unemployment between young people. We have 20% of, of families living in poverty. 77% of all people, retired people, living with less than 100 euros a month, etc., etc., etc. And nothing was happening before May 15th that I'm talking about because everything changed very deeply in May 15th this year. Well, nothing was happening. No, we had a general strike in the public sector in June last year, which was pretty successful. And we had also a general strike in every sector in September 29. But after this, the bureaucrats of the two big unions were saying that the, the strike was not very successful, and they were calling for the social peace with the ruling class and with the government. Many people were asking, we were from, from Lucha asking for more strikes, like in Greece, like in France, but the bureaucrats of the two big union, who are the only ones who can call for successful general strikes, were asked, were calling for the social peace. They, they call it like that, I don't know why. But suddenly, in May 15, everything changed, as I said before. 
And nobody was expecting this. We were not expecting this. Expecting this. For example, in my city in Seville, we were going to the demonstration, and we were expecting maybe 500 people, 1,000 people, and suddenly it were, there were 5,000 people only in Seville. These demonstrations all around the state were called by a small group, a reform, reformist a small group, organized mainly in internet. And they were not either expecting this huge demonstration that people were taking the street, people were angry for protesting. They tried to do this, this small group tried to do this, for example, in February, but we were seven people in the square. But suddenly, in May 15, we were thousands of people in every big city all around the Spanish state. From then to now, things have changed very, very fast. And it's amazing how every day more people are joining this movement of indignados, of outraged people. I think we think we are in an historical moment right now in the Spanish state. We don't know if it's the, the beginning of the Spanish Revolution, as, I, as some people call it. But what we know is that it's happening something that it didn't happen before. Sometimes the demonstrations remember to the demonstrations against the war in Iraq, but it, this movement is much more political. The movement started in, by a call by this group and a call to reform the labor, the, the labor, no, sorry, the representation law. But from the beginning, people had social demands. They, they want the rich to pay for their crisis. They don't want to pay for the crisis of the people who, who, who made the crisis. And this movement, you can see that it's inspired by the revolution in the Arab countries, by the fightings in Greece, in France, by the revolt of the students here in Italy, by the, also what is going on in Iceland. And this movement opens many opportunities for the radical left in the Spanish state. The first, um, the first phase, the first period of the movement was these big demonstrations in, in all around the Spanish state. And that night, some people come in the middle of Madrid in Puerta del Sol. And the Spanish police, which is very clever, took those people out of the square very violent, violent, violent with violence <laughs> in the middle of the night. And that, that call, that, mm, that house, uh, had tens of camps in every mm, big city. More than 100 squares were occupied by people mm, and organizing the camps, discussing about the political situation, calling for demonstration, and every day more people and more people were joining the movement. A second phase came, like, a second period in the movement came, like, maybe three weeks ago or, or two weeks ago, and the movement mm, moved from the occupied square to the neighborhoods. So now there are assemblies in every neighborhood in many, many cities, assemblies with tens of people, with hundreds of people, discussing about politics, organizing demonstration, building bridges between local fighting and general fighting. For example, when they, the banks are going to evict someone who cannot pay for the loan, hundreds of people go there and stop it. For example, this is happening in Madrid or in Barcelona, and at the same time they are connecting these local fights with the general fight against the crisis. And many people in the, in the movement, we, between them, want that movement to go further to a, a fourth period, where when the people are acting from the war places. It's the, in the demonstration, many people are calling for a general strike. We want another general strike. Mm, the government, what is the government doing? The government is starting to do small reforms, and they are desperately looking for a representation of the movement. Where, where are the people who, who we can talk with? Where, and they want people who represent the movement with very soft reforms, but what they are finding is a huge movement organizing from below and, and with very radical reforms. So, and also the pressure is getting the bureaucrats of the two big unions, and they are starting to call for demonstration to, with the delegates of the unions. So it looks like we can, in the future, call from below for a general strike. 
Soon we will have general election for president, presidential elections, and all the surveys say that the right is getting to the, to the government, which is something contradictory with the situation I'm describing, but the right is getting to the government, it looks like, because the, the social democrats has betrayed their basis, the working workers' basis again. But it's not the same that the right get to the government, the conservative party get to the government with the people that press in their houses, than if the right get to the government with the people fighting in the street, asking for another general strike. Um, one of the slogans that's the, that is very popular in the demonstration now in the, in the Spanish state is la, la crisis que la paguen los capitalistas. The capitalists have to pay for the crisis. And actually, actually, we are not going to pay for the crisis, but well, we are already paying. But I think what the people think when they say that is that we are not going to pay for their system. We are not going to pay for this fucking capitalist system that means that means suffering, that means injustice. I think that when people talk about the Spanish Revolution, they, are, they know this is not a revolution because still we are not acting in this movement from the working, from the workplaces. But they don't see alternatives to improve their life in the Social Democrats or in the Conservative Party. Every day, more and more people are joining the movement and they know that the, the, the alternative that the, the democracy, this democracy is given to them are not alternative. So um, that's why they are speaking about the Spanish Revolution. And I would like to finish telling that I think it's very important we have to coordinate the resistance in an, in an international way. We, are, we have to coordinate and to earn from each other strikes, riots, revolts, revolution, because this, more than ever, is an international fight. Thank you. Comrades, I think it's obvious that the death of the crisis has put new and important duties on, on the left, and especially on the radical and anti-capitalist left. The first duty has been to, to explain the nature and uh, the characteristics of this crisis, of this global crisis. Uh, explaining the crisis is not, is not an end in itself, or some kind of an intellectual task, but uh, it has been crucial in order to, to, to help the movement uh, to have a clearer picture of the trajectory of the crisis, in order to help the activists to, to be more able to predict what they have in front of them in order to understand uh, what are the capabilities of our opponents. Well, for example, this analysis has been crucial in, in Greece. Uh, when the first scuffles between sectors of the movement, sections of the movements and the, gov and the government uh, emerged, in order to understand that these scuffles were coming from the, from the future, not, not from the past. Uh, these were the first signs of working class resistance to the crisis, so we should support it. We should uh, generalize the example, uh, not keep back uh, in fear of being isolated, for example. So, uh, the parliamentary left was, was deeply disorientated when the crisis erupted, either by saying that um, the crisis, the debt crisis, was not a real thing, and it was just a, a passing away trend, and so on, or by saying that uh, the first austerity measures by the government would be able to, to, to resolve the crisis, so the movement was already defeated. Or by saying that Greece is quite a small country, so this crisis cannot uh, be uh, an international European issue. So, I, I, think, I think the second duty is to connect with all, with all these new recruits of our movement, all the people who are getting radicalized, and get into action. A, a recent poll in, in Greece showed that uh, in, uh, in the last months, more than two million people took part in one day or another, in some form of action or another, in, in the occupation of a square or in a strike, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, another sort of statistic showed that in the last year, we, in Athens, we had two demonstration every, demonstrations every single day. 
So you can understand that the majority of these people have no, don't have a long experience of organizing and come into the movement bringing all their enthusiasm, but also bringing ideas uh, from, from their past. So uh, the, the, the important thing is that in Greece we have seen a, a combination of, of, of two factors in the movement uh, in the previous year. One, on the one hand, uh, was what we could call uh, the spirit of Tahrir Square. I mean, uh, the people resisting austerity in the neighborhoods, occupying squares and saying, down with all of them. Uh, on the other hand, there was this sustained wave of uh, working class action, of, of, of uh, strikes, of occupation in separate sectors or, or in big general strikes. So this combination ha has been very, very, very crucial. Because of the existence of, of this spirit of, of, of Tahrir Square, the workers that went out on strike felt that they had the support of the majority, that they were fighting in the interest of the majority that their struggle is, is going to be sustained and it's going to, be, to have a political impact. On the other side, the, the, power, the power of the working class, of the work, the worker struggle, has, has helped the entire movement to orientate and be more politicized. The general strikes have, have given the opportunity to everyone to know that all these different separate resistances are from different workplaces, neighborhoods, schools, universities, and so on, uh, can be united. And there is an organized force that can push the fight forward, and that is the organized working class. So, the role of the anti-capitalist left uh, uh, has been very important in order to, to have all these developments in, uh, in Greece. Uh, as far as the first duty is concerned, explaining the crisis and providing a, an alternative, uh, the anti-capitalist left has been absolutely crucial. The program of the anti-capitalist left has, has now been at the center of the discussion in, 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 the, in the entire movement. The program that says, we should stop paying the debt, we should cancel the debt, uh, that we should nationalize the banks under workers' control, that we should break with the Eurozone, and for that we, we should occupy to, to save our jobs. Uh, it, 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 this program has helped with the struggle, have a focus, and the sense of the, of the strategic tasks we have in, in front of us. Well, comrades, in, in, in times of crisis, the, the, the self-emancipation of the working class stops being uh, just a slogan, and it, it, it has to find more concrete ways to, to, to express itself and uh, fought for. So, we shouldn't see this intervention of the anti-capitalist left in isolation from the rest of the left. Greece has the advantage of, of having two big parties, two left parties in, in the parliament, one of which is the Communist Party, that is... Um, still hard Stalinist, uh, some kind of an exception in, in, in Europe, but uh, it has been important for, for the configuration of the movement in, in, in the country. So what I'm saying is that the anti-capitalist program has pushed also the parliamentary left uh, to, to move in a more militant uh, direction, in a, to have a more clear direction in what, in what it does. I think the second achievement has been to not to let the movement divide into one side, uh, let's say, more uh, decentralized movement of the squares, on the other side, uh, the working class. But the government and the, the ruling class and the media has, have made a concerted effort, effort to, to do that, to, to, to play the, move, the squares movement against the, the working class movement. Uh, fortunately, they have lost this fight, at least for, for the moment. The, the reforms left has not been at all helpful in that. On the one hand, there was part of the left say, playing the idea that what's happening in the squares is more important than uh, the working class uh, struggle. Uh, so the activists should uh, orientate towards organizing in the streets and not in the workplaces. On the other hand, the Communist Party, uh, by being hostile to what was happening in the squares, by saying that uh, the demonstrators, they are middle class, uh, not political, uh, and so on and so forth, they are inexperienced, for example, what it did, if, uh, eventually, was to help these autonomous friends in the movement, because they were, say, uh, were, they, they were feeling hostile themselves towards left-wing parties uh, and politics and, and so on. Uh, I think we, we managed to, to break into this false division by being an integral part of what was happening in the squares, and at the same part, arguing openly and systematically that the orientation has to be 
for with the building general strikes, organizing all out strikes and occupations in the workplaces. And the spirit, the spirit has changed. In the first days of the occupation in Cedar Square, there was this tendency to, to speak about uh, you know no political parties, no no placards, no banners, and so on. But when the police dispersed the crowd for the first time on the 15th of June, it was the, the, the banners and the blocks of the anti capitalist left that uh, reoccupied the square and helped help the people go, to, go back in. So, some months ago, you could hear many people talking about uh, using the slogan, I, I won't pay, I don't pay, I won't pay. And usually it meant that they won't pay their bus ticket uh, in order to resist individually against, against the, the austerity measures. But now, the majority uses the word, the, the slogan, I won't pay, and they mean I won't pay the sovereign debt. So the movement has become more, more political in, in, in the last months. Actually, a, a recent poll showed that, even if it sounds contradictory, that this recent movement has made uh, has created a decrease, to, to, has made fewer people saying that uh, they're not they're going to abstain for the uh, next elections, and uh, or they're going to use uh, blank votes and so on. So the, the movement pushes more people towards the ideas of, of the left uh, and the politics of, of the left. We have been witnesses of this trend in the last uh, local elections in last autumn when. Uh, and the CM managed the anti-capitalist front in which SWP is part of. It managed to have to get 100,000 votes. Uh, that was four times the votes it did it had in the national, the previous national elections, and have 20 councillors elect, elected uh, along uh, around the country. <laughs> this last year has been also full of successes for anti-capitalists in the trade unions. There have lots of comrades have been elected in local unions and the BDP executives. Finally. I'd like to, to, to point out how important has been for us the, 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 the lessons of the revolutions in the Middle East. They have shown that we should not bow to the pressures of uh, realism in times of crisis. The instability of the system is uh, so big that the left has to demand more and more political space for the workers' struggle to, to, to unfold and not, and not give any time to our opponents to, to breathe and organize. I think that the, the revolution has shown to us that there are no predetermined, predetermined limits to any struggle. The task of the, of the radical left is to, to, prove, to prove this in practice, to prove uh, this reality of the revolutions in practice. And I think this is a challenge for all of us. I still get nervous uh, talking at Marxism. Uh, it's much more nerve-wracking speaking here than in the Irish Parliament, I can tell you. I mean, day in, day out, uh, these days, um, I and others in the United Left Alliance get the opportunity to interrogate the Prime Minister about why they are bailing out uh, banks uh, while they're sacrificing uh, the, li the livelihoods, uh, the jobs, the vital needs of ordinary people. Uh, and I find that relatively easy, uh, but I get nervous. Uh, I get nervous here, and the main dif the, the, the difference, the reason I get nervous here is because the people here care. That's, that's the difference. The people here care about those things and about our society. Uh, and the people in the cesspit that is uh, the Irish Parliament, or frankly any Parliament, don't care. Um, or they wouldn't be doing uh, what they're doing. So, anyway, pardon me. The main thing I think we need to take out of Marxism uh, is something that Sammy uh, has underlined, and others, Alex, uh, yesterday. And that is that Egypt and Greece, the revolts that are happening there, are coming here soon. Uh, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And we have to... We have to prepare, and we have to prepare urgently uh, for, that, uh, for that task. How do we know that that is going to happen? Because this is a global crisis, and it is a systemic uh, crisis of the entire system, a crisis of a system that has run up against its own limits and has gone cannibal. It has gone cannibal. Uh, 
its strategy for dealing with the crisis that is now gripping the entire uh, world, uh, which is ripping uh, through the Middle East, now ripping into uh, Greece and Portugal and Ireland, is to give us more of the same that caused the crisis in the first place. It is astonishing, absolutely astonishing, that in the mainstream debate about the crisis, this fundamental feature of the response of the ruling class to the crisis uh, is not commented upon. That their prescription, I mean, it's bad enough that we had this crisis. It's bad enough that a crisis that was fueled by the relentless, unremitting greed of a tiny minority of people, bankers, speculators, corporate elites. It's bad enough that this uh, profound, uh, unbelievably severe crisis was caused by all that. But it is simply astonishing that there is virtually no comment about the fact that their strategy for dealing with the crisis is to do more of the same. It's unbelievable. I mean, when you look at Greece, the crisis, or Greece, or Ireland, or anywhere, the crisis was caused by deregulation of financial markets, by privatization, by a concentration of wealth in the hands of a tiny minority, and putting profit ahead of everything. What is their answer to the crisis? Privatize more, deregulate more, uh, reduce taxes more on, uh, on the wealthy, uh, and attack uh, the jobs, the livelihoods, the incomes, the services uh, of ordinary people. Precisely the prescriptions that got us here, they want to intensify uh, that agenda as their response uh, for the uh, uh, to the crisis. And that means it is guaranteed to get worse. And it is getting worse. Every day that they implement their response to the crisis, the crisis gets worse. And isn't it obvious why that would be the case? How on earth, how on earth do you generate economic recovery and growth by taking the income of ordinary working people that do work and who spend their income in the economy? Isn't it obvious? But if you take the money out of the pockets of working people who actually spend their money in the economy, that the shops and the businesses and the uh, factories and the offices, if you like, that rely on them uh, spending that money go out of business. And it's visibly apparent uh, everywhere. Their strategy is insanity. We are going to save our health service by closing down all our hospitals. We are going to save our education system, which is the future of our society and economy, by closing down schools, uh, by uh, sacking teachers, uh, by uh, robbing those schools of the resources they need to educate our children uh, properly. It is insanity, absolute insanity, and it means, it means the crisis will get worse. And it means Resistance, resistance of Egyptian and Greek proportions is guaranteed. Guaranteed. It's not because it would be a nice idea. It's not because Egypt is inspiring and it is inspiring. It is because, as Sami said, it is a matter of survival. And Ireland is testimony, a stark testimony uh, to that fact. We have had two years of austerity to pay the gambling debts of the bankers and speculators who stoked up the property bubble, bankers and speculators in our country, but also though the people who financed that in the big banks of Germany, France uh, and Britain. We've had two years of vicious uh, austerity. 15 or 20 percent pay cuts for public sector workers, vicious social welfare cuts, vicious cuts uh, to child benefit, a massacre of public sector jobs, and the more public sector jobs they massacre, the less money there is in the economy and the private sector collapses uh, as well. We've gone from zero unemployment to 450,000 un unemployed. We've gone from net immigration into the country to 170,000 people flooding out of the country in the last uh, two years. And their strategy is to do uh, to do more uh, of the same under the auspices of the IMF EU deal. This isn't just going to cause and is causing terrible, terrible suffering for ordinary people, but it simply can't work. It simply can't uh, work. The, uh, I mean, the scale of the crisis in Ireland is staggering even by Greek proportions. Uh, the Greek 
our debt is 300 billion, and they're saying the IMF EU deal is unsustainable, even if people accept all the austerity, uh, because you simply can't pay back uh, that level of money. The Irish debt is 250 billion for a country that is a quarter of the size. And astonishingly, our finance minister, when we stand up in the parliament and say, Greece is coming here, why the hell are you telling people in this country to suffer this austerity, to pay back, uh, to pay back uh, the bankers when this is utterly unsustainable? And uh, he responds to this by saying he wants to produce t-shirts saying Ireland is not Greece. Uh, because of course they are terrified Ireland will become Greece, but this insane logic that if we obey, if we bend down, if we are servile, uh, in front of this monstrous injustice and this crazed austerity that some, somehow uh, we will be rewarded by the vampires and the vultures of the IMF, EU and the bankers and so on uh, who caused, uh, who caused uh, the crisis. It's madness. But why? Because people say, but why are the Irish not fighting back if this is, uh, if this is the case? Uh, and there's been taunts which our Greek comrades told us, in fact, weren't true, uh, but they were reported in the Irish media, and maybe that in itself is telling, that on the Greek demonstrations, people held up banners saying, uh, we're, we're, not, we're not like the Irish, we fight back. Now our Greek comrades told us this wasn't, in fact, said on the demonstrations, and then it makes you think, well, why is the Irish media reporting uh, that it was said? Because, of course, that's what they want to do. They are terrified of the Greek contagion of revolt spreading, and they wish to demoralise people. And if you want to understand why, at the moment, the Irish are not fighting, uh, and it is a temporary phenomenon, first of all, it's important to say that when the first wave of austerity came in, the Irish did fight. The Irish working class did fight. Between 2008 and 2009, there were two mass demonstrations of 100,000 people against the austerity, there were public sector general strikes, uh, there was a massive and successful uh, revolt by pensioners against attempts to take away their automatic entitlement uh, to free healthcare, there were students' uh, revolts. And everybody expected that though that resistance would escalate against the monstrous austerity that was being imposed uh, by the government. But the union leaders wound it down on the basis of saying there's a general election coming. If you elect uh, Fine Gael and Labour, uh, who are going to go into coalition with them, they will immediately raise, maybe even reverse uh, the austerity. It's been bad, but it will improve. And this uh, demoralised people calling off the demonstrations, but maybe also there was a little hope against hope that maybe Labour would improve the situation. But as soon as they get in, the betrayal uh, commences with in incredible speed. They, insofar as the new government uh, were the main be beneficiaries of the anger against the old government, Fianna Fáil, the main pillar of the Irish establishment, who were massacred in the election, a historic massacre of a key pillar of the Irish establishment, the Green Party no longer exists, the people took their political revenge on the uh, political parties and representatives who caused the crisis and who implemented the first wave of austerity. But they thought maybe the new government would be slightly better because they had used the rhetoric in the election of saying the IMF EU deal is a disgrace, we will renegotiate it, we will get Ireland back working, we will give a stimulus program, and so on. Within 24 hours of the election, they put up their hands and said, no, this isn't going to happen. The IMF EU have told us we must do this, we accept. Any talk of burning the bondholders got off the agenda. Maybe we can get a 1% reduction in the interest rate, which makes no difference uh, in any event to this unsustainable uh, uh, debt. And even to do that, we have to oppose the vicious austerity with absolute, uh, with absolute, uh, as, as, absolutely uh, systematically. So it becomes clear that they are not reversing the attacks of the last uh, government, but still people think maybe they won't do more. But next week, the IMF EU arrive in town. The, pro the, the uh, IMF program for Ireland is very specific. It says there must be de a de complete dismantling of all the protections that exist for low-paid workers. Hundreds of thousands of low-paid workers. They're demanding property charges on ordinary people, not on the rich, ordinary people. Water charges across the board, uh, cuts in public sector, in all departments, in education, health, more privatisation, etc. And the point is that as these attacks begin to rain down, 
the, the resist people have to resist because people now can't pay their mortgages. There are tens of thousands of people who just can't pay the bills. Many people have no disposable income whatsoever. Uh, I think the figure was something like 200,000 people with no disposable income whatsoever after they've paid their bills. Uh, so people cannot take any more austerity. They will have no choice uh, but to, uh, but to uh, resist. Uh, so the resistance is coming. Very lastly, where do, where do we fit in this? The uh, election is a big step forward for the left. The formation uh, of a, a new left uh, organization, which we in the Socialist Work Workers' Party, if you like, spearheaded the argument for realigning the left, for building a, a united force, for overcoming all the old sectarian divisions, had precisely the effect that we thought it would have, and suddenly propelled radical left politics into the center, uh, into the center of Irish national political debate. This is an extraordinary. what all that means, but I'll just finish by saying this. This is a huge opportunity. We, given the massacre of Fianna Fáil, the massacre of the Greens, the radical left and Sinn Féin are the national opposition. Uh, not only were five UL8 TDs were elected, but there was also about five or six independent principles left TDs, so there is now a significant block of about ten left-wingers who are, if you like, arguing for cancelling the debt, uh, for resistance, and so on. But the key thing for us, is uh, summed up with the phrase uh, Lenin used to describe uh, Parliament. He said, Parliament is a dung heap. You can stand on top of it to shout louder, to organise the people outside, but whatever you do, don't fall into it. And this is absolutely, is absolutely true. For us, there must be no parliamentary mechanism. Speeches don't change the world, only the action of masses of people, working people, people on the streets, uh, will change it. So our job is to use the platform of the Dáil to organise the mass resistance uh, outside, on a united front basis, on the basis of reaching out to people who don't necessarily see themselves as socialists, uh, but who reject the austerity programme and who believe there is an alternative which is based on taking the wealth back off the super rich and using that money for the jobs, the services, the industries which can actually push our uh, society forward instead of the cannibalistic programme that has been put forward by the EUIMF. We have a huge opportunity uh, to do that, but as Sammy said, we have a lot of work. All of us. This can be done everywhere. The struggle is coming. The crisis is coming. People are looking for answers. If we are clear and concrete and organised and work very, very hard, we can shape the course of that resistance. If we don't, if we don't, you know, it's, uh, it's an Irish saying that says, if you're in a hole, if you're, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Right? They are continuing to dig. But the question is, are they digging our grave or are they digging their grave? That is the question that confronts us. We have to ensure that they are going to get the Thank you very much, but Richard, you're a hard act to follow. Um, what I'm going to do is to talk a bit more about some of the, the, the problems and opportunities that face the radical and revolutionary left in, in Europe. It's very clear from what we've already heard that the defining issue in Europe today is austerity and the resistance to it. Resistance to it. And the importance of Greece is it brings it makes visible so starkly the combination the most brutal austerity policies being imposed on people, but people fighting back on an immense and growing scale. And the challenge for any serious left in Europe is how they relate to building the resistance and helping to transform that resistance into, into something, something revolutionary in the way that, that Richard was, was talking about. Now, the, if we talk more concretely about the radical left in Europe, the truth is the picture is quite mixed. And it's mixed at two levels. The first level, the first is the level of politics, because you can see a kind of spectrum of organisations, starting with versions of left reformism that are particularly evident in, in Die Linke in Germany, which represents a very important break in the strong, what is still the strongest social de democracy and workers' movement in the in the, in the world, moving moving left, left. You can carry on leftwards 
to the hit organisations like the organisations represented on the, the pa panel today, but also, also the new anti-capitalist party in France, in other words, parties that stand on explicitly revolutionary programs. So there's a degree of diversity in the nature of the radical left in Europe. There's also immense diversity in their, in their situations, in that we can identify moments of advance if we just talk about the electoral front, very important moments of, of advance. Richard has been talking about the successes of the United Left Alliance in, in Ireland, the advances of Antarctica in, in Greece and, and so on. But there are also setbacks. Recently there was a general election in Portugal, the Left Bloc, which is one of the most important formations of the radical left in Europe, saw its parliamentary representation hard from 16 to 8, uh, you know, in, in lots of ways a very worrying phenomenon, since this was an election which is essentially on the question of austerity, but it was an election that was run, won by the parliamentary right with the social democracy, the equivalent of the Labour Party, the Socialist Party, being, uh, being kicked, uh, kicked, out of, kicked out of government. So the, the, it's not simply that the politics is diverse. It's also that the the situations are quite are quite diverse, and I just want to emphasise two questions that I think are really really important. The, one, the first is the relationship between um, the electoral struggle and the broader movements and, and struggles, and I think Richard got it absolutely right. The electoral terrain is important because it can give you a platform from which you can build the struggle more effectively. And when, and you know, just listen, listening to, to Richard, you can, you can imagine what difference it makes to building the movement of austerity to people like him in the, in the Doyle, challenging the government uh, and uh, doing everything they can to help the development of struggles outside. Another comrade of ours, Petros Constantinou, is on Athens City Council representing Antarctica, and he, by all accounts, is creating absolute mayhem using, using that word. So, electoral successes are absolutely brilliant, but they're brilliant if they're seen as part of the process of building larger movements of struggle that are going to succeed outside the parliamentary arena, on the streets, and above all in the, in the workplaces. And I, I, I emphasize this because I think sometimes there's a tendency to define what the parties of the radical left should be doing, essentially in electoral, electoral terms. To see the electoral front not simply as one front of struggle, and in lots of ways not the most important front of struggle, struggle, but rather to, 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 to see it as the overarching purpose of the, um, of, of, the, of the operation, to reduce what a party of the radical and revolutionary left does to, to what it does electorally. I think this is, a, this is one thing that can get organisations into, into trouble. Um, I, uh, uh, for example, the new anti-capitalist party in France is facing a very deep crisis at the minute. And that's because, essentially because it can't agree what to do about the French presidential elections next year. Now, the French presidential elections are, are important and in a certain way they got slightly more interesting as a result of the developments in the last, last couple of days. But to imagine that the most important thing that revolutionaries in France should be doing is worrying about who they're going to support in the presidential elections next year when the, the great um, the great juggernaut of austerity is smashing its way through French society as it is through other European societies. Seems to me to, to get the get the priorities quite wrong. Apart from anything else, elections are are an extremely difficult and unpredictable terrain to work on, as we uh, here in Britain have learned to our considerable cost. The, the Portuguese comrades in let's get it right in the general. The general election before the last general election, sorry, the general election two years ago got eight seats. In the following general election, they went up to 16 seats because they succeeded in winning support 
away from the Socialist Party, the Portuguese equivalent of the Labour Party. Then, in the recent election, they lost the additional eight seats they got, mainly because they think the Socialist Party voters they won previously went back to try unsuccessfully to keep the right wing um, from winning office. It's a tremendously fickle and unpredictable terrain. So it's really important to make electoral advances and we should celebrate the successes that, for example, the United Left Alliance should have. But we shouldn't see the, the, the main thing that the parties of the radical and revolutionary left are, are doing uh, as being, as, as being winning, winning elect, uh, seats, winning uh, intervening in elections. The second really important thing is something that was mentioned particularly by, by Nikos. It's not simply that the parties of the radical and revolutionary left need to be building the movements, building the struggle. They need to be uh, not simply celebrating the struggle, but trying to, to shape those struggles in a particular way. And the critical, one of the critical things at the present time is uniting the squares and the strikes. What we've seen in recent months as um, both Jesus and Nikos described, is these fantastic movements driven by youth revolt that have filled, uh, have filled the squares of, of the Spanish state and have also filled Sinagma in Athens. That's abs absolutely fantastic. But unless that revolt is linked to the assertion of collective working class power expressed in the ge general strikes, then eventually those revolts will burn themselves out. We've seen that in Britain. The wonderful student movement of last autumn, absolutely magnificent, electrifying, inspiring, but something that actually burnt itself out quite, quite quickly. I mean, we could feel its after effects. You could feel on the strike on Thursday and on the demonstrations in particular, the spirit of the student movement continued. But the, the important thing was precisely the fusion of the energy, the militancy, the anger that the students expressed with the collective power that only workers can exercise and are most visible when, when workers go on, on strike. And that kind of fusion of the squares and the strikes doesn't happen automatically. It isn't something that spontaneously is going to develop. It has to be worked for and organized and fought for by, by activists. We've learned, you know, listening to Samir Nagid speaking at this rostrum earlier today, that the miracle of Takriya Square wasn't simply a miracle. It didn't just happen that it was built by the hard work, the persistent effort of organized activists of the left and of other tendencies opposed to the, to the, to the uh, Mubarak re regime. And that, the lesson of, of, of that experience applies to all of us. We have an immense responsibility to shape the movements and struggles that are, that are developing. So our absolute priority has to be the, to those struggles, but we need to understand that movements happen without us. Movements aren't something that people on the far left simply can take out of their pockets when they think it's appropriate. They happen to a large extent independently of us. But we have the capacity, wherever we are, and however small and relatively disorganized we may be, not simply to be part of those movements, not simply even to build those movements, but to shape them in a way that can defeat, destroy the great juggernaut of austerity, and begin to open up a perspective of revolution towards a different kind of world.